Last year, the Rams of Coach Chuck Knox gloried in the sun of a 12-2 record, the best in club history. This year, they expect better. For Denver and their coach, John Ralston, last year was also a high-water mark, a season of smiles. But last Sunday, the Broncos needed all the firepower they could possibly muster. And so they started with a bang that knocked plucky Jim Bertelson for a looping somersault. Those came up with their lone touchdown of the day on a Charlie Johnson connection to Billy Van Heusen. That closed the scoring gap to 17 to 10. But that first step would be a severe one, for the Broncos' record-breaking preseason had taken a heavy toll of personnel. No fewer than four other regulars were sidelined. And against the powerful Los Angeles Rams, those casualties proved decisive as the Broncos fell 17 to 10. The On a sunny Colorado Sunday, Denver's Mile High Stadium was an aptly named site for one of the National Football League's most dramatic games in some time. A true Rocky Mountain High resulted from this confrontation between two of the most pass-oriented teams in the league, the Broncos and the Steelers. The game produced a total of 10 touchdowns, 70 points in all, and it made history. The first regular season sudden death playoff under the newly revised rules this year. The Denver Broncos are a somewhat unique football team. They owe this quality to their innovative coach and general manager, John Ralston, a man who believes in total togetherness for his squad. Such deviant behavior as accompanying his team on field and hand-holding in the huddle comes naturally to Ralston, who is a great devotee of positive thinking. But it is paying off for the Broncos, who turned a 5-9 record around last season and barely missed the playoffs with 7-5-2. Their upset victory over the Steelers kept Pittsburgh from winning their division. Once their coach was safely off the field of play, the Broncos surprised everybody with a daring onsides kick to start the game. Jerry Simmons and Otis Armstrong both covered the kick, and the Broncos' special team had made the first big play of the day. Here, too, Denver's kicking game prevailed as Billy Van Heusen put the ball out of bounds on the Steelers' one. This, too, is a result of the new rules. More kickers will attempt the coffin corner to prevent a long run back. was forced to punt. Bobby Walden kicked sky high, but Charlie Greer's short return brought the ball to the Steeler 45. In the exchange of punts, the Broncos had come out on top, gaining 10 yards. Only one play for Denver to capitalize. Otis Armstrong took Charlie Johnson's pass and went 45 untouched yards to score. The passing attack had produced the first touchdown, but the Broncos' fine kicking game had made it possible. Denver had drawn first blood 7-0. setback made a great effort and took advantage of fine downfield blocking to go 61 yards to the tying touchdown. next series, Charlie Johnson came up with his second long pass of the day, and Haven Moses made it work. A repeat shows that Flying Moses had badly beaten his defender and would have scored if he hadn't had to leave his feet.
Moses was the main man in the Charlie Johnson aerial show last season. The team led their conference in passing, and with the addition of Otto Stowe, Denver could be even more deadly through the air this season. From the three, Johnson tried Moses again, but Jack Ham batted the ball at the line. However, Moses had again beaten his defender, J.T. Thomas, Pittsburgh's number one draft pick two years ago. So on the next play, Johnson went his way again. The Broncos were now on top, 14 to seven. Right back, went to the air lanes and hit Frank Lewis, who in turn was hit by Calvin Jones. Number 51, Mike Simone, was the recipient of Lewis's gift and lumbered all the way to the one. Repeat of the play from our sideline camera reveals little number 26 Calvin Jones hooked his arm around Lewis and punched the ball loose. was a big play, a very big play made by a very little man. It will be one of many today for five foot seven inch Calvin Jones and the Denver Partisans saluted him. From the one, John Keyworth went in for the touchdown that brought the score to a surprising 21-7 advantage for the Denver Broncos. Once again, Pittsburgh's running backs did more with the pass than the wide receivers could, as Franco Harris took a swing pass to the one. In personally. At the end of a pass-filled first half, the Steelers had come on strong, but the Broncos still led 21-14. With excellent field position, Gilliam moved the Steelers in to tie. Franco Harris was the main man on the drive, making a fine catch for 14 yards, then crunching for 10 more down to the Denver one-yard line. From the one, Steve Davis banged it home, and the two teams were tied. Pittsburgh 21, Denver 21. 63 John Grant and Lyle Alzado recovered on the Pittsburgh 41. The break was all the Broncos needed to bust free. Otis Armstrong got six on the left side, then blazed through right tackle for 32 yards to the Steeler three. From there, Ramsey sent Billy Van Heusen in motion to the right, flooding that zone, and hit wide open Riley Odoms for the touch. Though Johnson was gone, a combination of Steeler mistakes and good relief pitching put Denver back on top 28-21. From the 10, Gilliam got still another great catch from Frank Lewis. Lewis's feet were in the end zone, but the ball came down on the one. And from there, Davis scored his second touchdown of the quarter. Game tied 28 all, but the tie would not last long. On the second play of the fourth quarter, Ramsey was blitzed by Andy Russell, and the ball squirted right to Marv Kellum on the Denver 16. Four plays after Kellum's catch, John Fuqua squirmed in, and Pittsburgh led for the first time in the game 35-28.
Jones popped the Gilliam pass right to Bronco linebacker Tom Jackson, and the Broncos had a big break. Turnover proved costly to the Steelers when Ramsey hung in despite a hard rush and hit Onus Armstrong. Armstrong's touchdown, his second of the day, tied the score for the fourth time in the game. It was now 35-35, but Pittsburgh would mount two more drives in the game's last seven minutes. This game 22. Gilliam eventually drove the Steelers to the Denver 8 with five seconds left, and another chance to end the game in regulation time rode on Roy Jarella's toe. Incredibly, Jarella's almost certain 25-yarder was blocked, and the NFL had its first regular season sudden death game with a score 35 all after four quarters. Denver linebacker Tom Jackson made a game-saving play. Jackson blitzed Gilliam back to the Steeler 49 and into a throwing down and on the next play Gilliam thought he had number 86 Reggie Garrett open but ex steeler John Rouser intercepted ending Pittsburgh's only threat of the sudden death. Now it was Denver's turn. Armstrong number 24 carried or caught on eight plays of Denver's 10 play drive to wind up with 107 yards rushing in the second half plus overtime period while almost single handedly carrying the Broncos to the Steeler 19. But Ramsey went to the well once too often and on his last carry Armstrong lost five yards fourth down on the Pittsburgh 24. Into the game came Jim Turner to try a 41-yard field goal to end the game, a kick that Bronco head coach John Ralston said after the game, Turner would make 39 out of 40 times. This one must have been try number 40. Turner missed. And now just three minutes remained. Neither team could gain even one more first down. And though they had played a full extra period, the game still ended in a tie. Pittsburgh 35, Denver 35. There are those who will say that the new sudden death rule does not go far enough because as proved by this game, ties will still exist. But over 51,000 fans who witnessed the game in person will fight you all the way. They had seen one of the most exciting games played in many seasons. And if the sudden death period failed to establish a victor, it did provide 15 extra minutes of gut-grabbing suspense. The following week brought the world champion Pittsburgh Steelers to Mile High Stadium for a game unrivaled in terms of sheer explosiveness. The Broncos started it all off with a game-opening onside kick and went on to a stunning 21-point first quarter lead. Yet 21 points was merely a prelude to this marathon of games. A mega game in which 70 points were scored and the NFL's first regular season overtime enacted. But as a tie, it was a game without a victor. And coupled with a Washington loss, it left the Bronco players and fans with a great deal to learn about the world of contention. The Denver Broncos do not possess a lengthy winning background from which to summon pride leaving head coach John Ralston with the task of instilling a winner's consistency in the Bronco attack force. However, big gains like this one by number 44 Floyd Little were few and far between as the Chiefs stormtroopers powered in on the sputtering Denver offense. At one point, the Broncos took three shots from the Kansas City three-yard line, only to be snagged amid the tall timber of the Redwood Forest.
But the Denver runners were not all that tumbled as the Chiefs secondary and linebackers held the visitors to under 100 yards passing, twice intercepting. Number 78, Bobby Bell, scored untouched and barely avoided a clothesline tackle from a teammate as the Kansas City defense covered for their slightly off-target offense. The Chiefs offense managed to score only once, and that came on a short burst by Willie Ellison, number 24. Trailing 14-3, Denver finally managed some offense as number 10 Steve Ramsey replaced an ineffective Charlie Johnson at quarterback. John Keyworth scored to bring the Broncos to within four points, leaving it up to Mike Livingston, number 10, to control the clock for the Kansas City Chiefs. But Livingston misread the coverage, and number 26, Calvin Jones, gratefully accepted the gift, returning the ball to the Kansas City 11. Denver would now need only two plays to claim the victory. John Keyworth barreled in for his second touchdown as the Denver Broncos were finally able to claim a 17-14 victory over the thoroughly disgusted Kansas City Chiefs. The Kansas City Chiefs were the Broncos' fourth opponent and with the disillusionment of September behind them, the Broncos resolved to make October a month of victory. The Chiefs led 14 to three at the half, but then the Bronco defense rose to devastate their attack. With the defense surging into control, the offense shook off its inertia and began to roll. Twice, the offense sparked by substituting quarterback Steve Ramsey embarked on scoring drives. And indeed, October had begun with Denver's first victory ever in Kansas City. If suspicion of number 10 Steve Ramsey's ability was present before the game, his first drive was definitely a well-executed rebuttal as he drove the Broncos downfield with precision passing. By the time number 80 wide receiver Jerry Simmons was pushed out of bounds on this pitch from Ramsey, the Broncos were at the New Orleans 38-yard line. From there, Ramsey, giving the Broncos a new wrinkle with more maneuverability at quarterback, rolled out and pinpointed number 25 Haven Moses for his sixth completion in six attempts. At the New Orleans doorstep, Ramsey prudently handed off to number 24, Otis Armstrong, who won a foot race to the flag and put Denver up seven to nothing. New Orleans came back with a field goal, however, and when Ramsey started the next drive, he never took his eyes off his target and his pass was doomed. Number 40, Terry Schmidt took it on in. It was not the last contribution by the New Orleans defense, however, because in the third period, Ramsey was victimized again. This time, number 37 safety Tom Myers made off like a bandit to the Denver one, where his effort yielded seven additional Saints points. But unfortunately for the Saints, such acts of brilliance were merely isolated occurrences, as was this 58-yard hookup to number 88 Joel Parker, which put New Orleans on the Denver 22. Typically, when threatened, the Broncos resorted to what they do best, and that means tighten your chin straps to the opposition.
Following his first interception, Ramsey showed a lot of confidence as he returned to the airways to find Haven Moses open and instinctively knowing which way to run with the ball. At the New Orleans 25-yard line, Ramsey performed his interpretation of the bootleg, then flipped a pass to number 44, Floyd Little, whose some yardage had Denver in business at the six-yard line. From there, Ramsey rolled right and lofted an easy six-pointer to an unattended number 88, tight end Riley Odoms. On the next series, number eight, Archie Manning, in attempting to keep pace with the Denver point production, let loose a pass that quickly had him racing to cut Denver safety Bill Thompson off with his six-point interception. But Thompson wasn't to be denied. And suddenly, the Broncos had 20 points on the board. Number 10, Steve Ramsey, was to be heard from again as he returned to number 25, Haven Moses, whose savvy runs amassed him 132 yards for the day. Once in close, Ramsey went back to number 24, Otis Armstrong, who slid off one good hit to score and give the Mile High boys a 26-10 lead. It was obviously a day of good and bad for Steve Ramsey, but his best was this 43-yard connection to Billy Van Heusen, who ran it in to complete a 33-17 defeat of the obviously road-weary New Orleans Saints. Broncos next warmed up for the New Orleans Saints, and Steve Ramsey was called upon for his first start as Charlie Johnson had joined the growing list of injured. The fifth-year pro responded with poise to his pressured assignment and on his opening drive threw six for six to the Saints' three-yard line. Ramsey completed his series with a handoff to Otis Armstrong and the Big Orange were on their way to victory number two. It was a confidence-boosting afternoon for Ramsey as he threw two touchdowns and accumulated 295 yards passing. But he saved his most impressive pass for last and it was a picture of precision. By the time Billy Van Heusen strode into the Saints' end zone, the Broncos had themselves a 33-point afternoon and sole possession of second place in the AFC West. With two victories, the Broncos were now gathering the momentum of success. However, their next opponents were the dangerously explosive San Diego Chargers. But any self-doubt that existed soon dissolved as the Denver offense surged to a new level of proficiency. With Charlie Johnson back in the lineup, the Broncos moved through San Diego territory for 354 yards of total offense and three touchdowns. And when Jim Turner kicked the final three points, the Broncos were at last in possession of the winning edge. The Chargers had been averaging over 350 yards of offense per game, but the Broncos never even allowed them to get started last Sunday. The end of the first half, the demoralized San Diegans had amassed an offensive total of 50 yards. For number 14, Dan Fouts, it was a day nothing could go right even when his end of the business was right on. Number 36, Bill Thompson, took Wayne Stewart's bobble for the first of two interceptions he would have for the afternoon. It's actually hard to find fault with Fouts as his second interception once again bounced out of a receiver's hands into Mr. Thompson's obviously more receptive grasp. It was a fine all-around performance by the Denver Team D as they held the Chargers to 84 yards on the rushing ledger. While the San Diego offense sputtered, the Denver offense rolled behind the inspiring runs of number 44, Floyd Little.
With Little free of ankle problems and number 12 Charlie Johnson recovered from nagging injuries, the Broncos moved 80 yards on their first possession. At the five, Dr. Johnson eased a pass to number 88, tied in Riley Odoms, who scored made it seven nothing Broncos. In the second quarter, the Broncos added a little more complexity to their attack when Charlie Johnson flipped a lateral pass to Billy Van Heusen, who in turn passed to Riley Odoms for a 41-yard pickup. On the six-yard line, Floyd Little took an inside counter for a 14-0 Denver advantage. But Floyd's biggest thrill of the day came on a simple swing pass. Number 40, Joe Bochamp, missed the tackle. And number 44 had himself a foot race. At 32 years of age, Floyd may have lost a step or so, but he still squeezed 72 yards out of that little bitty swing pass. From the 10-yard line, Charlie Johnson handed off to number 24, Otis Armstrong, who slipped through a knot of tacklers into the San Diego end zone en route to a 27-7 Denver victory. In Cleveland, about the only one who's smiling these days is the Cleveland Indian. But what he's witnessed these autumn afternoons high atop his perch over cavernous old municipal stadium is enough to even turn his grin into a scowl. For the Cleveland Browns, once one of football's finest franchises, are on the precipice of disaster. The man in the hot seat is head coach Nick Scorich, whose job is rumored to be in jeopardy, but the blame must be shared by the entire organization. Many markets decline with the trade of Paul Warfield for draft rights to Mike Phipps, although the swapping of Ron Johnson for Homer Jones was even worse. Or perhaps it's the natural erosion of talent due to an annually high draft position for leveling is its purpose, and Cleveland, along with former powers like Baltimore and Green Bay, have felt its effectiveness. The quarterback is always most visible, and Mike Phipps has never overcome the burden of replacing hometown hero Warfield. The fans' wrath has grown, as has the cries for his backup, little-known Brian Sight. No matter who's at quarterback, his past targets, with one exception, are pedestrian. Steve Holden was inexplicably put in the closet his rookie year, but this season has been sensational. Unfortunately, he's missed four of the six games with a knee injury, and his effectiveness is now in doubt. With an attack as sparkling as the current Dow Jones averages, Cleveland needs a healthy Holden. The offensive line, which once consisted of such great names as McCormick, Sandusky, Groza, and Hickerson, now ranks dead last in the entire NFL in protecting the passer with 24 sacks. The running with Greg Pruitt, Hugh McInnes, and Ken Brown has been exceptional, however. Today's opponents, the Denver Broncos, never seem to get out of the shadow of the Raiders and Chiefs in their Western division. But they are 3-2-1, and one, and for this game have an edge against Cleveland in quarterback Charlie Johnson. When Johnson was with St. Louis years back, he somehow always found a way to beat the Browns. So on this bright Sunday in Cleveland, it seemed the sun was setting on an old power as the Denver Broncos faced the Cleveland Browns. Fitz. When Phipps got the ball away, he viewed virtually every pass from the prone position. And on four attempts, he could find no open receiver and was stretched out with the ball still in his possession. Part of Phipps's problem was that the Browns had practically no running game at all in the first half to keep the heat off the harried quarterback, as three Cleveland runners could amass just 23 yards. Number 30, Ken Brown managed just seven. Hugh McInnes, 12, and mercurial Greg Pruitt got exactly four yards. Hong faked to Otis Armstrong, then hid the ball on his hip before finding a wide open Billy Van Heusen for 37 yards. Play fakes don't mean much unless there's a running game to back them up. And using Armstrong, number 24, who rushed for 44 yards in the first half, Johnson sustained the Broncos' first drive. 
At 5'10", many experts said that Armstrong was too short to play in the same backfield with less than six-footer Floyd Little, but both are strong runners. And looking at this play again, we can see that Armstrong pulled out of the grasp of 265-pound Walter Johnson, who advanced the Bronco drive 13 yards. From the Cleveland 12, Johnson pumped once and hit tight end Riley Odoms for the score as Denver broke on top 7-0. There's growing sentiment around the league that Odoms is pro football's premier tight end. He's a great blocker, excellent catcher, and when he's got the ball, he's at his best. On the touchdown play, Odoms was grabbed almost instantaneously by Walt Sumner, and even when help arrived, Odoms was still able to muscle across. Denver fans, expecting to see the Broncos in the title chase, were somewhat disappointed in a 3-2-1 start, but Johnson was injured for several of those games. But he was 3-for-3 three three for 62 yards in the Broncos' first possession, and a healthy Charlie Johnson was moving the Broncos again. This time, Johnson was 2-for-2, two two, and from the 13, he hit Jerry Simmons on the identical play that he speared Odoms on moments earlier. Simmons also had to fight the last two yards, going over Tom Darden instead of Sumner, and Denver led 14-0. In a nailed Phipps for a 13-yard loss, taking Cleveland out of field goal range. Bugaboo, the sack, stalled the Browns' drive. Fortunately for the Browns, Phipps fumble came after the whistle. Though they did not get the touchdown, they at least kept the ball, and Don Cockroft's field goal made it 14-3 Denver. Undaunted, Johnson went up top again, eluding the Cleveland rush and hitting Haven Moses for 17 yards. Then using the sideline, Johnson spotted Floyd Little, who bobbled but got out of bounds on the Cleveland 30 with seven seconds left in the half. Jim Turner lined up a 47-yarder, one that might not have been tried were there more time left in the half. For under the new rules, his miss would have been brought back to the line of scrimmage into good field position. But no matter how long or how hard he stared at that ball, obviously not a member of the Body English School, Turner could not make it go through. And though Denver's defense had totally stymied Cleveland in the first half, the Broncos led by only 14-3. Repeating the play from ground level reveals that Johnson was hit from the blind side and that the ball lay uncovered, tantalizing seconds before Roman scooped it up. But Denver was able to blunt the Brown opportunity. After yet another sack, Phipps tried for McInnes, but linebacker Tom Jackson made a nice save at the five. Viewed from another angle, we can see that Phipps at last got time, and McInnes was open, but Phipps underthrew, enabling Jackson to get a hand on the ball. Cockroft semi-saved the drive with a field goal, but Cleveland needed touchdowns, not field goals, and trailed 14-6. Still, they had gotten a break. The defense held, and Tom Darden returned a punt 45 yards to set Cleveland up again, this time on the Denver 33. But again, Phipps could not move the Browns in. And for the third time, Cockroft came through. Cleveland now trailed 14 to nine. Otis Armstrong went 33 yards and Denver upped its lead to 21-9. Armstrong now totaled 122 yards rushing for the day. And though Denver had been in danger of losing control of the game, Defense and a potent ground attack had bailed them out. Defense and running. Just the elements that the Broncos needed so they could control the rest of the game. Or could they? Sure enough, on the first play of the fourth quarter, Mike Phipps arched a sideline pass for Gloucester Richardson that was caught in a crowd by Calvin Jones, who lateraled to Lonnie Hepburn for additional yardage. 
this is the last we're to see of Phipps today, so let's take another look. He actually had enough time on the play, but Richardson never came clear, and Phipps heard the footsteps, then felt the punishment of Barney Chavez. Cockroft caught Denver completely unaware, faked a punt, and ballooned the ball to a waiting and lonely number 21, Van Green. Cleveland had the ball on the Denver 16. A great Cleveland tradition, Abraham Abraham, the famed man in the brown suit, finally had something to cheer about. Ten. And Sipe was again faced with extinction. But on a pressure play, he hit Steve Holden, who made the tough catch over the middle for a first down. Holden, though operating way below maximum ability due to his bad knee, made a very big play. His catch put the Browns on the three. Sipes' gutty play brought the Browns to within five points, and an interested observer named Phipps watched as Sipe received accolades from his teammates. The better blocking, but watch number 37, McInnes' block, as number 26, little Cal Jones, rolled off it and caused the runner Pruitt to leave his feet and subsequently be tackled short of the goal line. With time running down, all eyes were on sight. He went to the sideline for a strategy session with Scorich. While he's a stranger to public attention as a pro, Sipe had plenty of it in college. One of a long line of pro-style passers developed by offense-minded Don Coryell at San Diego State, Sipe was the national passing champion in 1971 and broke all school records held by Don Horn and Dennis Shaw. Ironically, it was Sipe's fine preseason performance that prompted the Browns to trade fellow alumnus Don Horn to San Diego. Now from the three, Sipe called a quarterback sneak and made the play of the day. Brian Sipe had his second touchdown in three minutes, and Cleveland had the lead for the first time today, 23-21. Now, Charlie Johnson found Otis Armstrong free and clear over the middle, but a desperation grab by linebacker John Garlington knocked the ball loose. Armstrong would have surely scored had he held on. Now on fourth and four, 35 seconds remaining, Denver had one last opportunity, a 51-yard field goal attempt by Jim Turner. The Browns bench tells the story as Cleveland pulled off the upset and ended their torturous four game losing streak. But suddenly they flashed to life as quarterback Charlie Johnson hit Armstrong on a flare pass and the speedy second year man zipped 48 yards to the end zone. However, last week, the Raiders were not to be headed, and Kenny Johnson and the Broncos fought to catch up. A pass to tight end Riley Odoms, number 88, forced the big man out of bounds, much to his dismay, but set up a field goal, and Denver closed it within 11 at 21 to 10. And fired across the middle to number 42, wide receiver Billy Van Heusen, who strolled 73 yards to bring Denver to within four points. From the outset, the enraged Broncos pillaged and plundered the Baltimore Colts. All day long, quarterback Marty Domre's nemesis was Barney Chavez, number 79, a multi-talented second-year defensive end. Chavez's interception was disallowed, his temperature boiled over and spilled into the lap of the luckless Domre's. Determined to make the Colts pay dearly, 
Chavis relentlessly pursued Marty all across Memorial Stadium until he exacted his pound of flesh. With their defense roaring, the special teams howled as Bill Thompson blazed 60 yards on a punt return. Denver cashed in on Thompson's return for six when Charlie Johnson's fake froze Rick Volk number 21 and Riley Odoms had an easy touchdown. For most of the game, the young Colts held the skittering runs of Otis Armstrong in check. Only once did Armstrong escape, but it was enough to turn a close game into a Bronco victory. The game ended with a display of sportsmanship that has become expected between receivers and defensive backs. No longer does one spike the ball. Now you must spike your opponent. Final score, bad sports 17, good sports 6. Dramatically, the offense came pulsing to life with a 532-yard Monday night effort. Six days later, the arch nemesis Oakland Raiders were the opponents and the Broncos ripped them up with a record-breaking ground attempt. Otis Armstrong stepped off 146 yards of Raider real estate and teammate number 32, John Keyworth, rolled for 148 more and the game's first score. Against one of the most revered defenses in the league, the Broncos surged for 410 yards of offense, and Steve Ramsey to Jerry Simmons made it 20 to 10. By afternoon's end, the Broncos had drawn a sweet measure of revenge as they snapped the Raiders' nine-game winning streak and could once again revel in the jubilation of victory. As the saying goes, Thanksgiving came early for Oakland fans when two weeks ago the Raiders became the first team to sew up an NFL division championship. And last week they figured to increase their lead over a heretofore disappointing Denver team. Oakland opened fast and furious with two potent rookie runners. Number 34, Harold Hart, was dynamite on this 67-yard kickoff return. Then number 30, Mark Van Egan, showed that he, too, has a silver and black future. However, as good as Oakland's youngsters were, Denver's were even better. Number 24, Otis Armstrong, accounted for 146 Bronco rushing yards on 29 carries. But even better was number 32, John Keyworth, a rookie who put Denver on the board first and racked up 148 yards rushing with a 10-yard per carry average. While the Broncos were chalking up the rushing yardage, Ken Stabler and Fred Belitnikoff were connecting through the air. For the day, Fantastic Fred had eight receptions for 121 yards and two scores. The first on this 34-yarder and tied the game at 10-10. However, on this day, Fred's heroics were no match for the slashing runs of Keyword, who once again unlocked the door to the Raider end zone. Then Steve Ramsey whistled an eight-yard scoring pass to Jerry Simmons, and Denver led 20 to 10. Once again, Ken Stabler went to his man of the hour, Fred Belitnikoff, whose second score pulled the Raiders to within three at 20 to 17.
In the end, that was all the Denver defense would allow as the Broncos stunned the playoff-bound Raiders in a game that meant little in the standings, but returned a measure of respect to the men from the Mile High City. To conclude a torturous three-game schedule in just 11 days, the following Thursday, the Denver Broncos traveled to Detroit's Tiger Stadium for a snow-clad Thanksgiving Day contest with the playoff hopeful Lions. As the second quarter ended, they trailed 17 to 10, but a daring second-half kickoff turned the whole thing around. Number 22, Fran Lynch recovered, and the Broncos were in business at midfield. Moments later, number 24, Otis Armstrong, took in a deceptive draw and bolted 31 yards to put his team on the Detroit three-yard line. From there, John Keyworth smashed over for the tying score, which triggered a 21-point third-quarter avalanche of Denver offense. And as Jim Turner kicked the final point, a national television audience of 35 million had witnessed the Broncos take a long stride toward a winning season. After losing four straight games by a total of 14 points at the beginning of the season, the spirited Detroit Lions under new head coach Rick Forzano have turned their season around, winning six of their last seven games and now facing the revitalized Denver Broncos, the Lions hope to nurse their faint playoff hopes by continuing their winning ways. Mistakes like this Charlie Johnson faux pas intercepted by Levi Johnson were pretty much the story of Denver's disappointments early this season. But the Lions could not dent an improved Denver D to cash in this opportunity. Both teams struggled in a standoff until Steve Owens broke open on the longest run of his career, good for 27 yards. And ironically, Owens was injured and lost for the rest of the season on the play. Adding insult to injury, the Broncos forced the Lions to settle for a field goal from the one. And midway through the second quarter, Otis Armstrong ran through a trap at right guard, cut left, and erased 32 yards, setting up a one-yard touchdown plunge by John Keyworth, making the totals Denver 10, Detroit 3. But Greg Landry, replacing the injured Bill Munson, came right back, finding Alty Taylor wide open with this 23-yard touchdown pass, nodding the score at 10. In slow motion now, on the very next series, Charlie Johnson swung a pass to Otis Armstrong, who handled it more like a volleyball, batting it to Levi Johnson. And look out, mistakes again, making the score Detroit 17, Denver 10 at the half. The Broncos opened the second half with a perfectly executed onside kick. And riding the momentum of this aggressive play, they swept to three touchdowns in the third quarter. Otis Armstrong, whose 144 yards and 24 carries gave him a total of 1,082 for the season, set up the first with this 31-yard jaunt. John Keyworth took it the last hard yard. But midway through the period, Armstrong himself slipped over right in to make the score Denver 24, Detroit 20. And Charlie Johnson capped a 50-yard drive in five plays with this pass to Riley Odoms, increasing Denver's total to 31. And that was enough as the Broncos held on to dump the Detroit Lions for only the second time in the last eight games, 31-27.
With the Bronco offense at full throttle, they next faced the rugged defense of the Houston Oilers, and Denver tore them up. For the third time in four games, the offense exploded for more than 400 yards, 183 of which came from the sprints of Otis Armstrong. At game's end, the 37-14 victory ensured Denver of a winning record. Their stretch goal was realized, and their season of contention proudly salvaged. It wasn't like the old days when rushing out to meet the Houston Oilers was like running into a mound of whipped cream. Nevertheless, the Broncos got to Dan Pastorini early just to keep him in the mind of those bad old days. But the Oilers' defense was only mindful of crunching Denver's Charlie Johnson, which they did six times for 51 yards in losses. The newly ferocious Houston pass rush forced Johnson to dump the ball short and quick to receivers like number 42, Billy Van Heusen. However, last Sunday, the prime Denver weapon was number 24, Otis Armstrong, who pounded for 183 yards to break Floyd Little's club record and tighten his grip on the NFL rushing lead with 1,265 yards. Armstrong gave the Broncos an early lead on a 10-yard burst, and Denver was never to be headed. With the Broncos leading 17 to nothing, the Oilers finally generated some offense on a reverse to number 84, Billy Johnson. Johnson scooted 25 yards, which was enough to set up a one yard pop by Fred Willis, which made the score 17 to seven Denver. But then came Otis again, this time on a 12-yard sprint to Pater, which upped the Bronco lead to 23-7. In former years, the Houston team would lay down and expire at this point in the ball game, but last Sunday, they never gave up. Another Pastorini to Johnson hookup accounted for a near touchdown as Billy shuffled and weaved for 44 yards. From there, Pastorini hit Jeff Queen in the end zone to make it close, 23 to 14. But it wasn't close for long as Charlie Johnson came right back to hit Haven Moses and just about wrap up the victory. All that was left was for Otis Armstrong to tie a big bow on the package, which he did with his third touchdown of the day as Denver rode over Houston 37 to 14. And although the Broncos are not playoff bound this year with men like Otis Armstrong on the roster, next year they may truly present their strongest challenge ever in the AFC West. The greatest success of the 1974 season was the achievement of Otis Armstrong. Playing in the shadow of Floyd Little in 73, number 24 as a rookie carried 26 times for a meager 90 yards. But at the start of 74, Armstrong got his chance and defenders have been shaking their heads ever since. At 5'10", 195, Armstrong combined a low profile with darting quickness to make him a draw player without peer. And while Armstrong...
Armstrong made the Denver draw deadly, his pure running ability was always a thing of astonishment. progressed, Otis Armstrong continued to slash his way to fame, and at season's end, he stood directly behind Jim Taylor, Jim Brown, Jim Nance, and O.J. Simpson for the most yards ever gained in one season. joined that elite class of runners by amassing 1,407 rushing yards. And in doing so, Otis Armstrong became the fifth back in the history of professional football to average better than 100 yards per game for the season. The NFL rushing championship that Otis Armstrong won in 1974 is in many ways more than an award to an individual player. It is, moreover, the product of a team realizing its potential as it journeys to become a champion. At season end, the Broncos stood as one of 10 winning teams in the NFL. In 1975, the lessons learned from their first year of contention should make their goal as champions a reality.